on our earth before writing was invented, before the printing press was invented, poetry flourished. That's why we know that poetry is like bread. It should be shared by all, by scholars and by peasants, by all our vast, incredible, extraordinary family of humanity. That was Pablo Neruda. I'm Bob Holman, and this is the Poetry is Bread podcast, where poetry challenges us, makes us think, and with imagination and courage and heart, changes the world. Today, we're lucky to be with Martina Espada, a thunderous presence, a powerful political voice, a Walt Whitman of now. Martin Espada's poetry is as expansive as the glorious titles of many of his books and poems, The Immigrant Ice Boys, Bolero, City of Coughing and Dead Radiators, Vivas to Those Who Have Failed, and you can call me sappy, but here's the greatest title ever award going to Martin Espada, Rebellion is the circle of a lover's hands. I could live in that title. Well, Martin's now a professor of poetry at UMass Amherst, but his first job was as a tenant lawyer in Boston, which has some similarities with this job of being a poet. He's a fierce advocate of justice for the poor and oppressed, a deeply persuasive way with words. And don't forget, tenant lawyers and poets are known for their paltry remunerations on the salary tip. He's got 16 books at last count, won the National Book Award and the Ruth Lilly Prize. And of course, Martin has a wonderful connection with Neruda himself, and he even called his brilliant anthology of Latino-Latina writers poetry like bread. We caught up with him one night before he gave a reading at the Bowery Poetry Club. Welcoming to the microphone, Martin Espada. Thank you, Bob. So it is your birthday, and I know that uh, your mom uh, was a Jehovah's Witness. I mean, she was a Jew like my... No, my mom... You're more Jewish than I am. Okay, you want to back that up a little bit? Uh, sure. We... You want to unpack? <laughs> okay, I'm just not sure where you're going with I'm it. I'm going to mm. your birthday. I'm going okay. to the fact that we're celebrating your birthday, but as I understand it, your mom was an anti-birthday, anti-all holidays. Yes, yes. Um, that's true. I didn't celebrate my birthday. I was a kid growing up. Um, so now when people make a fuss about it, I am um, uh, confused, sometimes <laughs> uh, mortified. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there is a, apparently a biblical justification for not celebrating birthdays. And it has to do with uh, the fact, as pointed out by the uh, witnesses, that the only two birthdays celebrated in the Bible were Pharaoh and Herod. Um, and, uh, and now, you know, they happen to be the, the two who are running for president of the United States. <laughs> anyway. Hey, Sam, is that the air conditioner you think should it be turned off? I kind of think so. I but mean, it's nice and cool in here. But. All that having been said, you know, I mean, uh, Donald Trump is the creature from the White Lagoon. Mm. Get it? I got it. Yeah. Yep. So I'm voting for the other one. I'm going to vote for the other one. And it's... Oh, I, it reminds me of the uh, the list of uh, rules that you made for the Provincetown Writers Workshops. Yes. You know. Yes, in the voice of Captain Ahab. Yeah. Um, Which was in the voice of Captain Ahab. Uh, well, yeah, in the voice of Captain Ahab, but it, and really, it was it was uh, it was based on the uh, the Gregory Peck 
uh, interpretation of Captain Ahab in the John Huston movie of Movie Dick. Mm. So I guess you, you had to be an aficionado of uh, poets in the poetry industry. But let's not go there. We wanted to talk about poetry today. That's right. Well, let's. What was your first poem? Well, you know, I no longer have that poem in my possession, but I recall it very clearly. Um, and it so happens that um, I wrote it at the age of 15. Now, um, I have to preface this by saying that I was a terrible student. Mm -hmm. uh, I once failed English in the eighth grade, and now I am a professor of English, which only demonstrates the uh, uh, circuitous path that one's life may follow. Well, let's, step, let's even back that one up a little. So did, did you uh, speak any Spanish growing up? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, that did not help, however, when it came to academics. Um, and I was um, severely disoriented and dislocated in a variety of ways. And so I began acting out uh, by withdrawing. And uh, before you knew it, uh, I was receiving the lowest possible grades for certain academic performances, uh, ironically enough, in English. I was perfectly fluent in English, right. even articulate in English, uh, and yet that has nothing to do with uh, what you do academically. As you well know that many times the poet is the kid in uh, the back of the room um, glowering at you or asleep. Uh, so you were you were reading, you know, you had your own reading list back then. I wasn't. I wasn't reading. I had no idea what the hell was going on. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, was sitting uh, one day uh, in the back of the room, right, in tenth grade English class, um, trying not to be seen, uh, trying to be ignored, which was always difficult in my case. You um, were a big guy. Yeah, well, I was big enough. And I was there with the other young thugs, mm. you know, in the back of the room. And uh, our teacher, whose name was Mr. Valeka, I don't know his first name, Mr., uh, came up to us and said, uh, young thugs, I have an assignment for you. And he held up a magazine. And he said, this is the New Yorker magazine. Uh, now, we had never heard of the New Yorker magazine uh, we were all New Yorkers, but this was a very different New York. And he said, what I would like you to do is to make your own edition, your own version of the New Yorker mm. magazine. Mr. Vileka. Mr. Vileka came up with this brainstorm. And so he handed the magazine to us, and he left us alone. And um, the magazine moved from hand to hand down the hierarchy of thuggery. So it began with the biggest, toughest guy who thumbed through the magazine and of course he came uh, to the movies, uh, the reviews at the beginning and he said, oh, movies, I like movies. And he became our film critic. Um, and so it was passed, as I say, from uh, hand to hand down the hierarchy of thuggery until it came at last to me at the bottom of the food chain in that particular room. And the only thing left at the back of the magazine was a poem. Mm -hmm. And I was very upset. I remember saying, oh man, a poem. But um, I did not want to fail English again. My father was waiting at home with the big hands. And so I set about to write a poem. I uh, went and sat by the window. It happened to be raining that day. So I wrote a poem about rain. I do not have the poem anymore. I did not realize it would be an important historical document. I don't remember anything about the poem but for one line. Tiny silver hammers pounding the earth to describe rain. I had just invented my first metaphor. I did not know what a metaphor was. Uh, a couple weeks later, somebody told me, and I went strutting down the hallway. I made a metaphor. I'm bad. But um, That's I not only... Tiny silver hammers. Tiny silver hammers pounding the earth. Pounding the earth. To describe rain. I was 15 years old. That was my first metaphor. So already we are at work. Already. Um, and I discovered, in addition to metaphor, something else that day. I discovered that I loved words. Mm. I discovered that I loved banging words into each other and watching them spin around the room and jump out the window uh, into the rain. 
Um, and almost immediately thereafter, I began writing about the themes that I'm still writing about today, at the age of 59. Um, Happy those birthday. The theme, yeah, the, today is regrettably my birthday. Um, but those themes would be, you know, community, uh, uh, friends, family, uh, wow. so autobiography, this, right. autobiography. So almost this, this sarcastic and yet inventive assignment to recreate the New Yorker, where you get to be assigned to be the poet. Do you remember if you read the poem or if you took, I mean, did you have any relationship to poetry prior to that? Or? No. 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 The, so, I can remember vaguely the first time I was exposed to poetry in a classroom and I absolutely hated it. Mm. Um, I, uh, in fact, it was uh, in, in middle school and there was a sour-faced teacher by the name of Mr. Dunn mm. um, and uh, not to be confused with the with poet John. Stephen Dunn oh, or, or St- John Dunn no. or any of the other well, Dunns. Done. It's, it's mm. been done. Because it's overdone. Um, so, uh, but uh, to be sure, uh, he chose the wrong tack because what he wanted us to do was to uh, memorize and read aloud the lyrics to the Mikado. <laughs> and I, I was not then, nor am I now, a fan of light opera. Mm-hmm. So uh, that being my introduction to poetry, I emphatically rejected it. And I thought, well, this is poetry. It has no relationship to me. And oftentimes that was my response whenever I encountered any uh, academic presentation of poetry, even as an undergraduate in college, when I took an introduction to poetry class, I you know, had the cannon uh, aimed at me. And I couldn't see myself in the poets that we read. You know, I couldn't see myself uh, in, in Eliot uh, or So Stevens. you did take a, an undergraduate poetry course, though. So whatever it was that got you when you were 15, and, it's, it, and you actually started to write poems at that point. Yes, I started to write poems before I started to read them. Um, And then my father, uh, who himself did not know much of anything about poetry, who himself did not uh, go past high school, uh, got wind of this interest. Um, And uh, he gave me my first collection of poems. He gave me my first book of poems. And And what was that? It was The Ruby Out of Omar Khayyam. Mm. Um, Of course, you know, I actually wrote wrote a poem about it. Uh, about that experience, and um, I think it's like the one book you don't have here um, called The Trouble Ball, but uh, the poem I wrote was called The Playboy Calendar and the Ruby Out of Omar Khayyam, Mm -hmm. because he gave me both um, when I was uh, (laughs) 17 years old, and, and, you know, I responded to both, but the lessons of the Ruby Out and the lessons of Omar Khayyam stayed with me longer than the lessons of Playboy. Um, you know, as I say in the poem, you know, the calendar was no longer useful to me once the year was up, you know, it could no longer tell me the month of the year, but, uh, you know, uh, Kayam woke me up this morning, you know, uh, you know, awake, he said. So, so your dad may not have been, you know, that into poetry, but he, he was, he would become an artist, become a, a he must have had, uh, what was his engagement with the arts at that point, or your engagement with him? him his you his engagement with the arts was something that I recall from early as childhood, because uh, my father was a photographer, a documentary photographer, and had been in one uh, form or another uh, since uh, my earliest years. Hmm. And, you know, I was born in 1957 in Brooklyn. Um, my father did not do this professionally or full-time when I was born. He was uh, working as a draftsman for an electrical contracting company, and by all accounts, hating it. Um, and uh, he got involved um, in um, community organizing in the 1960s. He got involved in uh, a leadership role with the Puerto Rican community. And that went hand in hand with his work as a photographer. So uh, in the 60s, he photographed the movement. He photographed um, civil rights leaders. He photographed rallies. He photographed his own community, our community, which was the East New York section of Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Uh, We we grew up uh, in the Linden Projects there in uh, Wortman Avenue and then later Stanley Avenue. Um, so, uh, he even at that time, um, photographed, uh, Malcolm X, 
uh, at a rally. He spoke at a rally with Malcolm X uh, shortly before Malcolm's assassination. Um, and then later on, my father uh, was able to get a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to fund the Puerto Rican Diaspora Documentary Project, a photo documentary and oral history of the Puerto Rican migration. Right, it and looks like so, you uh, used a lot of his photos on, on different book covers. Yeah, I've even lost track of how many book covers I did using yeah. my father's yeah. uh, photographs, something on the order of 10 one. or so. And of course the new book has a terrific photo on it yes. as well. This is a labor organizer, because it's, it's, it comes off as being like your dad. I don't know whether it has any of that well, that spirit emanates, but yeah, you know. In fact, I've already noted this book. Of yours, to those who have failed, was published in January, and um, one fundamental confusion I've already noticed is that uh, people think that's my father on the cover, and it isn't. Uh, he took the photograph. Exactly. Well, the, it's that play with art, which is something that you do. You mm -hmm. know, somehow the in your poems. You disobey so many of the rules of poetry um, in that you, you'll go f you go for it. You know, I guess that's the only way. I mean, people most commonly when they talk about you, they talk about the big guys. They talk about Whitman and Neruda who also went for it, go for it. But, you know, there's a rule, Martin, that you're not supposed to repeat a word in a poem. It's very carefully uh, protected by the MFA programs in town. Mm -hmm. And yet... Uh, there is, in your work, this magnificent uh, continuo of language that makes it, that gives the beat, that gives that hammer of the rain to the, to the ground, continues that beat. Well, you know? it's, um, first of all, I, in terms of going for it, it, it certainly, uh, when you talk about the poem as a musical form, when you talk about the musicality of poetry, I'm very interested in what we can do uh, with anaphora, with epistrophe, mm -hmm. with repetition, with refrain. Yep. I'm very interested in that uh, rain uh, pounding rain. the earth. Excellent. Um, the uh, content, in terms of going for it, that comes from my father. I picked that up mm -hmm. from him because his photographs go for it. His photographs are portraits of an invisible community. There's a very popular word out there right now. The word is erasure. You hear that word used all the time and already being misused. But it has to do with invisibility. And uh, there's a community out there that is so invisible, people forget it's invisible, and that's a Puerto Rican community, uh, even though it's almost one million people here in the city of New York alone. Um, and it was my father's uh, task and his uh, great love uh, his great commitment to to document that community, which is why we uh, we have these photographs, and um, that's how my father came to be known ultimately as a documentary photographer. Uh, yeah. Now he died uh, in February of 2014. Um, he died in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, mm -hmm. a town called Pacifica, uh, at the age of 83. Um, I was not there at the moment. Uh, my, my brother called me and he said, uh, you know, it's happening, it's happening, you have to get here. And so I booked a flight out. Um, I got a call on a Friday night. Um, uh, got booked a flight for Saturday. There was a blizzard. Uh, mm. uh, the flight from Boston yeah. to San Francisco yeah. was canceled that Saturday and he died on Sunday. Oh. So I arrived on Monday right. yeah. and, and set about trying to um, put put things back together. Yeah. So. so let's let's go back into the um, into that into that moment now that you're so you've just arrived back there what are um, in in San Francisco and what yeah, led I'm from there and, and, yeah, yeah and then all from right, that into the, the poem into the poems. Are we yeah. recording? Good. Yeah. My father uh, died in February of 2014. Um, he was 83 years old. He died in a town called Pacifica, California, uh, outside San Francisco. And I got a call from my brother on a Friday night saying, you know, he's in the hospital. You better get out here. And um, I booked a flight from Boston to San Francisco on a Saturday, the next day, 
there was a blizzard. The flight mm. from Boston to San Francisco was mm. canceled. Uh, that Saturday, and my father died Sunday. So then I arrived on Monday, and then I set about trying to piece together um, what uh, had happened and um, realized that one of my first responsibilities uh, after the immediate business, after the business of the mortuary and the cremation and what have you, would be to memorialize him. Um, and so uh, a memorial was uh, organized for May of 2014. And I was the one who was going to deliver the eulogy, so to speak. I was going to have to write a poem for the occasion. I ended up uh, sequestering myself in um, what's called the Northeast Kingdom, uh, rural Vermont, not far mm -hmm. from the Canadian right. border, uh, where I would never catch myself ordinarily. So this was uh, now already uh, the middle of March in 2014. And um, I wrote 10 poems altogether, which form the heart of this new book. Um, and uh, I'm going to read one of them now. Good. Um, at various uh, readings, I you know, generally speaking, will read anywhere from one to four poems in this cycle. But uh, we have time for one, so this is the one I'm going to read. Great. From Vivas to Those Who Have Failed. Haunt Me for My Father. I am the archaeologist. I sift the shards of you, cufflinks, passport photos, a button from the march on Washington with a black hand shaking a white hand, letters in Spanish, your birth certificate from a town high in the mountains. I cup your silence, and the silence melts like ice in a cup. I search for you in two yellow Kodak boxes marked Puerto Rico, Nochebuena, Diciembre, 1968. In the eight millimeter silence, the espadas gather, elders born before the Spanish-American War. My grandfather on crutches after fracturing his fossil hip, his blind brother on a cane. You greet the elders and they call you Tato, the name they call you there. Uncles and cousins sing in a chorus of tongues without sound, vibration of guitar strings stilled by an unseen hand, maraca shaking empty of seeds. The camera wobbles from the singers to the television and the astronauts sending pictures of the moon back to Earth. Down by the river, women still pound laundry on the rocks. I am eleven again. A boy from the faraway city of ice that felled my grandfather, startled after the blind man with the cane, stroked my face with his hand dry as straw, crying out, Bendito. At the table, I hear only the silence that rises like the river in my big ears. You sit next to me, clowning for the camera, tugging the lapels on your jacket, slicking back your black hair, brown skin darker from days in the sun. You slide your arm around my shoulder, your good right arm, your pitching arm, and my moon face radiates, and the mountain song of my uncles and cousins plays in my head. Watching you now. My face stings as it stung when my blind great-uncle brushed my cheekbone searching for his own face. When you died, Tato, I took a razor to the movie looping in my head, cutting the scenes where you curled an arm around my shoulder, all the times you would squeeze the silence out of me so I could hear the cries and songs again. When you died, I heard only the silences between us, the shouts belling the air before the phone went dead, all the words melting like ice in a cup. That way, I could set my jaw and take my mother's hand at the mortuary, greet the elders in my suit and tie at the memorial, say all the right words. Yet, my face stings at last. I rewind and watch your arm drape across my shoulder over and over. A year ago, you pressed a Kodak slide of my grandfather into my hand and said, Next time, stay longer. Now, in the silence that is never silent, I push the chair away from the table and say to you, Sit down, 
Tell me everything. Haunt me. Martina Spada reading Haunt Me for his father from the new book, Vivas to Those Who Have Failed, an astonishing poem, ekphrastic poem inspired by art, just like the photo that your father took that graces the cover of this book, but a, a poem that um, describes uh, an image, of a photo of your father, but turning it alive through the language, having the gesture of the arm draping over you, that curl becoming a, 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 a living thing, the, um, the act of the embrace of your father bringing you in. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful uh, Im image, but a moving image. Well, it is literally a moving image, and um, we sometimes think that uh, people stopped making silent movies in the 1920s. It's not true. We were still making silent movies in the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, we call them home movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what um, Frank to in the poem are super eight uh, home movies that they were uh, recovered and then uh, burned onto a DVD that I could then oh, watch. Wow. So it actually exists. They this actually is, exist. This is this not is an imagination. That gesture of him putting yeah. his pitching arm, or that's it's such a and, great and bec image. And because oh, I have it on DVD, I was able to rewind it You did just using a button. And, and I found myself just m manically doing this mm -hmm. over and over and over mm -hmm. and over. And I had, because it was my responsibility to play a certain role in the process of death and mourning, I had... Uh, restrained the grief. Mm. I had restrained an yes. expression of the grief, and I watched this uh, whole movie, and it just poured out of me. Wow. Well, it certainly p it pours out of the page. You know, we're used to the black and white of the text creating the the metaphor is is an is an image. That's what we think of it as as an image. But the idea of this moving image pushes it both into life, but also makes the haunting possible. The haunting is a continuance, you, you know, stay with me, you know, keep that arm moving around. Well, on the one hand, if, if he haunts me, it's a way of um, staying alive. It's a way I keep him alive. Mm. It's the way, it, you know, when someone dies and you keep talking to that person after death, well, that's a way of keeping that individual alive. This is also a way of keeping him alive, of inviting him to come and haunt me. Yeah. But in more general terms, I think this is often what poets do. Uh, we invite the hauntings. We invite the ghosts. Yeah. We invite in the things that other people will not invite in. In fact, we'll do everything to repress. And you, uh, and it's not just your father, but it's your father's father as well. It's not enough to just have that yeah. because, and it, what was it that your father gave to you? It was a slide, yet another piece of art, you know, uh, 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 you know, a, a reference to, you know, to, to how in this, in, 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 in your lineage, art was alive, mm -hmm. and your grandfather now gets, he, what, what, and he gives it to you and says, he, um, next time, stay longer. Yeah. Isn't that what you like to say to your well, father? And those were the, yeah, well, next time, stay longer. <laughs> he said it to me, and now I'm saying it to him. Yeah. But, yeah. um, yeah, and the fact that when he said that, you know, the, the, I never saw him again. Yeah. You know, that was it. And, and so, um, but my father is there, my grandfather is there, my, my grandfather's brother, who I remember mm -hmm. as being absolutely ancient, you know, they're, they're all gone, and they're all yeah. there. Yeah. And I do that, you know, it goes beyond cousins, the cousins, the yeah, cousins yeah, are there. Everybody, and, you know, the whole everybody, family everybody, is, the whole, whole, you know, and they, around your mother's hand is yeah. here. And they say that yes. espadas, all the espadas are related. It's not a very common mm. uh, uh, surname. So the, certainly the Puerto Rican uh, espadas, we frequently, no, whenever we like find this. each other, you know, oh, you know, we're related. <laughs> but, you know, the act of, of um, memorialization, the, the act of memory, is not something that I extend only to the family. Right. A lot of poets, of course, will confine their um, ceremonies of, of lamentation to the family alone, but I see acts of, of, of 
public lamentation of public grief as being equally important. You are a, you are a poet of history and a, a poet um, both of praise and lamentation. Um, I just want to say this one thing before we leave, which is what I brought up earlier about the way you don't resist repetition, the, the melting like ice in a cup. Now, ice in a cup, that's ice in a cup, but ice in a cup appears at the beginning and the end of the poem. Yes. And that to me is, it's like that's what you risk. You will create this poem from the stuff it's made of and not forced to go to a something, make it new, not going to a make it new if, it, if what it is holds. And that's courage, you know. Yeah, it, well, I'm making it out of the things that uh, it's made of. Um, you know, that these things all happened, as yeah. I pointed out to you. This is the home movie in the, yeah. in the poem. is not a product yeah. of my imagination. It's an actual home movie. Right. You know, of course, I bring my imagination to play in, in every single line. But, you know, I begin with the stuff of, uh, of what we call, laughingly, reality. <laughs> Well, you know, the, uh, your final assignment and for, this pod, for this podcast, Martin, was to, uh, to read what's called the signature poem, the poem that's become most associated with you. And for you, it is a poem of lamentation and history, absolute history. That's the uh, title of, uh, of your uh, selected um, alabanza, which is... You know, takes as it, which is praise in its in its way, celebration, um, which is a whole tradition of poetry to bring, and yet, what it celebrates again is an event that is, that is sheer history, and and um, not one that would be considered, you know, that title would be considered to go worth it. It's a, it's the poem about nine eleven. Yes, it is a nine eleven poem, but uh, it's a nine eleven poem with a twist because the focus is on the food service workers who were killed that day uh, at the World Trade Center, uh, most of them uh, immigrant and many of them undocumented, uh, invisible in life and even more invisible in death, uh, which is why I wrote the poem, because I do believe that uh, an important mission of the poet is to make the invisible visible. Um, and of course, it's a poem that uh, in spite of itself, I suppose, continues to be timely because um, in its attempt to humanize the dehumanized, its focus is on uh, immigrants. And here we are in a presidential campaign very much focused mm -hmm. on immigrants, whether they're coming from Latin America or whether they're coming from Muslim countries. Um, and uh, we have one candidate who is advocating um, that we build a wall um, and on the one hand, and, and, and that we uh, ban uh, immigration from uh, certain countries outright on the other. That's why I referred earlier to Donald Trump as the creature from the White Lagoon. Um, and so this poem, although it was written under very different circumstances, is also a response to Donald Trump and to his followers because it gives a human face to those who they would dehumanize. Um, it, it's... Uh, it's what poetry should do, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so um, the, the title of this poem also refers to the trade union to which they belonged. Um, as I uh, said uh, earlier, alabanza means praise in Spanish. The full title is uh, Alabanza and Praise of Local 100 for the 43 members of hotel employees and restaurant employees, Local 100, working at the Windows and the World Restaurant who lost their lives in the attack on the World Trade Center. Alabanza. Praise the cook with a shaven head and a tattoo on his shoulder that said, Oye, a blue-eyed Puerto Rican with people from Fajardo, the harbor of pirates centuries ago. Praise the lighthouse in Fajardo, candle glimmering white to worship the dark saint of the sea. Alabanza. Praise the cook's yellow pirate's cap worn in the name of Roberto Clemente, his plane that flamed into the ocean loaded with cans for Nicaragua for all the mouths chewing the ash of earthquakes. Alabanza. Praise the kitchen 
radio dial clicked even before the dial on the oven so that music and Spanish rose before bread. Praise the bread a la banza. Praise Manhattan from a hundred and seven flights up, like Atlantis glimpsed through the windows of an ancient aquarium. Praise the great windows where immigrants from the kitchen could squint and almost see their world. Hear the chant of nations. Ecuador, Mexico, Republic Dominicana, Haiti, Yemen, Ghana, Bangladesh, Alabanza. Praise the kitchen in the morning where the gas burned blue on every stove and exhaust fans fired their diminutive propellers. Hands cracked eggs with quick thumbs or sliced open cartons to build an altar of cans. Alabanza. Praise the busboy's music, the chime chime of his dishes and silverware in the tub. Alabanza. Praise the dish dog the dishwasher who worked that morning because another dishwasher could not stop coughing or because he needed overtime to pile the sacks of rice and beans for a family floating away on some Caribbean island plagued by frogs. Alabanza! Praise the waitress who heard the radio in the kitchen and sang to herself about a man gone. Alabanza! After the thunder, wilder than thunder, after the shudder deep in the glass of the great windows, after the radio stopped singing like a tree full of terrified frogs, after night burst the dam of day and flooded the kitchen, for a time the stoves glowed in darkness like the lighthouse in Fajardo, like a cook's soul. Soul, I say. Even if the dead cannot tell us about the bristles of God's beard, because God has no face. Soul, I say, to name the smoke beings flung in constellations across the night sky of this city and cities to come. Alabanza, I say, even if God has no face. Alabanza. When the war began, from Manhattan and Kabul too, constellations of smoke rose and drifted to each other, mingling in icy air, and one said with an Afghan tongue, Teach me to dance, we have no music here. And the other said with a Spanish tongue, I will teach you, music is all we have. Martina Spada, reading uh, Alabanza. Extraordinary evocation, and something you know with the with the political poem. It's, it's generally, there's uh, people discuss rhetoric and, and 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 political opposition, and yet in this we have a, 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 the laying out of a population. We have, you know, from the workers who were who were um, at the windows on the world, and and their their dailiness jobs becomes the source of of our becomes our vantage point from it. Well, it should be our vantage point more often. Um, we are still uh, struggling with the fact that we don't take that vantage point often enough in this society. Um, the dailiness. Uh, of the labor that these uh, invisible people and these invisible hands create uh, to keep the machinery spinning. Um, and, uh, you know, by continuing to take those people and that labor for granted and by continuing to exploit and brutalize uh, the human beings that produce and that create um, everything that they do, um, we, we risk uh, seeing this society collapse. Uh, I think, uh, you know... Um, Why, when you said collapse, I just saw those buildings go down. Well, there are all kinds of, uh, there are all kinds mm -hmm. of explosions. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, when we are, we are looking at, um, you know, uh, a, a demagoguery, and for me what's more terrifying than a demagoguery is the enthusiasm for the demagoguery. 
uh, on, a, on a level that we have not seen in the society in a very long time, and yet which is a very direct product of the, the history of this country. This is not an aberration at all. Mm -hmm. This happens and is happening. And, you know, one of the ways in which we uh, do something about it as poets is to humanize the dehumanized whenever possible and to speak in, uh, in as many different ways as we can. And, and let's worry later about what's being heard when. Um, you know, oftentimes right. political poetry, as you know, is, uh, uh, is diminished and, um, and mocked as ineffective because we can't quantify its impact on the world. And we have to get used to that. We're not going to be able to quantify uh, the impact of a given poem on the world, even this one, which uh, has been out there for a while. You can't measure it, you can't label it, you can't box it, you can't uh, ship it. That's what you know. culture is. That's the nature um, of a poetic economy, that well, it's going to be the gift that cannot be m measured. And there's a problem with the algorithms that come in then, yeah. you know. It's different being able to number the, the number of endangered species that you have rather than the number of speakers. But if whether you're a speaker or not, it depends on, on, who, on who you are and what your relationship to the language and culture is going to be. Well, and speaking of the relationship to the language and the culture, the fact remains that uh, we live in a society today where language is increasingly divorced from meaning, especially in the political realm, uh, especially in the realms yeah. of power. Uh, we live in an age of hyper euphemism where in, enhanced interrogation is a phrase that we use when we mean torture. Um, and um, how do you did, did you do you still work as a lawyer? How does your legal training and your legal use of language come into play? I, something like this. I haven't practiced law in many years. Mm -hmm. uh, I still have my license, and you never stop thinking like a lawyer if you've been trained to think as a lawyer. Um, so that's always there. Um, that history is. You worked there. in Boston as a as a tenants' rights lawyer. Uh, yeah, I was among other things. Mm -hmm. I I was a supervisor for a program called Su Clinica Legal, a legal services program for low income Spanish speaking tenants in Chelsea, Massachusetts, uh, d distinguished from Chelsea, New York. Chelsea is a, a tough little town right across the Towin Bridge from Boston. It's a gateway city, a city of immigrants, and always has been. And the immigrants in the last generation have come from Central America and the Spanish-speaking Caribbean and Southeast Asia. And so, uh, yeah, I was engaged with that and indeed wrote many poems uh, about that experience mm -hmm. and about that community. Um, but ultimately, I think what poets can do, even poets who don't have a legal background, even poets who don't think of themselves as political, is to work to reconcile language and meaning. If, if uh, what the hyper-euphemisms of the age do, uh, what the languages of the powerful do, medicalese, legalese, bureaucracies, what they do is to drain the blood from words that we, the poets, can put the blood back in the words. We can say what we mean. And that is a political act in this time and place. Put the blood back into the words, says Martin Espada. So, um, you know, when we were just getting ready over here, you mentioned in our little Facebook promo piece that there might be some humor in our reading tonight. And um, I flash back on this uh, poem in, from the new book, about a visit that you made to the uh, to the aquarium, mm -hmm. that uh, just gave me a, a real hoot, and I was wondering if maybe we couldn't go someplace different here right. for a way to. I guess uh, we're we're going to, to we're this. going to end on a different note. On a different note, rather yes. than the severity. Um, well, up to this point, maybe we'll edit yeah. this thing. I don't know. You're allowed to edit, right? We're poets, after all. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's the, you we'll know. See. I don't okay, know what... sure. Well, uh, you know, um, I'm primarily known as a political poet, and um, I've always, though, and you're aware of this because you've followed my work for a very long time. Uh, I remember I, your reading at the New Eurekan Poets Cafe, yeah, The Rebellion in, is the yeah. Circle of a Lover's Hands, one of the great yeah. titles. Yeah, and that, that was 1991, so, you know, if you do the math, mm. that's 25 years ago. Um, 
And yes, we're still here. <laughs> um, so I've always had a, an, a, a streak of the absurd. I've always had a streak of silliness. And that's because the world around me is absurd and silly. And all I'm doing is looking at it. Um, I have read, speaking of the Neorican, I've read every place you could possibly imagine. Uh, the first public reading I did was uh, as a, uh, in the same bar where I was a bouncer. Um, and where I, was that? In Madison, Wisconsin. Oh, wow. Um, I once did a reading uh, uh, at a boxing gym in Willimantic, Connecticut for a team of young amateur boxers, uh, mostly Puerto Rican. I did a reading at El Matador Tortilla Factory in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, and I uh, did a reading at the Coney Island Aquarium. <laughs> and so this is a documentary poem about that experience in four parts with Roman numerals. Wow. And yeah, impressive, right? So let's go out on this aquatic note. Once thundering penguin herds darkened the prairie. One, poetry for tourists. The poets bring poetry to the Coney Island Aquarium. Around the corner from the wooden roller coaster creaking since 1927, tourists staggering away queasy yet hungry for a hot dog on the boardwalk. We will tempt them to taste the steamed tofu dog of poetry <laughs> instead. Two, poetry for jellyfish. Tonight, we declaim poems at the jellyfish exhibit, creatures that plummet like parachutes of light, illuminated mushrooms zooming sideways, amusing themselves, oblivious to the nuances of alliteration and assonance, silently refusing to clap after the last poem. Three, poetry for penguins. The voice of a poet on a loop installed in the penguin exhibit booms out poetry in praise of penguins. Once thundering penguin herds darken the prairie, once flocks of flapping penguins blocked out the sun. Now they cower behind a rock, peeking, ducking down, listening to poetry for penguins, hearing only the rumble of the almighty orca opening his jaws on judgment day. Four, no poetry for the octopus or the security guard. The Coney Island Aquarium is closed. We are locked in. The octopus glares at us with one huge eye. No one fed him today. No one read him any poems. We panic and flap like flightless birds. We rattle the gate, wailing in chorus. We are the poets. Let us out. The security guard glares at us with one huge eye. No one fed him today. No one read him any poems. He unlocks the gate anyway. The poets are escaping the aquarium into the poetry in the air. Yes, that is uh, Martin Espada. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. For reading from Vivas to Those Who Have Failed and some other poems as well. This has been a podcast. I can't believe it, um, but I said it. So I guess I'll have to uh, continue to uh, agree with what I am saying, that I am saying it. I am Bob Holman, and thank you for listening to Poetry is Bread. Subscribe to our podcast to get notifications of new episodes or check us out at BoweryPoetry.com. The podcast is co-produced by Ram Devanini and Flavia Roja with Rat Palax. Artwork by Fabian Cero Leo. This podcast series is funded by National Endowment for the Arts, New York State Council on the Arts, Governor of New York State and the New York State Legislature. We're on.